Welcome everyone um, and nice to see you all. Um, this is the Ecological Continuity Trust webinar series. A couple of bits of housekeeping before we start. Please can you make sure you keep your microphones muted and um, also if you can turn off your cameras that will um, save us a bit of broadband bandwidth. Sorry. Um, Please do pop your questions in chat as they occur to you. Um, you can open the chat using the little speech bubble, bubble at the bottom right hand corner. Um, and at the end, we will um, go through the questions in chat and um, potentially invite you to, to come and um, raise your point or have a discussion. Um, so please do pop them in as you think about them. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome today um, two speakers, uh, Christine Watson and Rob Graham, who are going to be talking to us about 32 years of research at Scotland's Rural College's Pollock Agroecology Rotational Experiment. Um, Christine, over to you. Well, thanks very much for the, for the opportunity to, to talk to you uh, today. Um, Rob and I are going to be doing the talking, but I know that both Kirsty Top and, and Robin Walker are online, and I'm sure we'll both be happy to, to get involved in, in, in questions at, at the end. Um, and I, it's nice to see amongst the audience some old friends of this experiment. So I thought I'd just start with this picture, and uh, you, can, you can see, um, you can see the, the, the experiment sort of nestled down in that dip in the glorious uh, Aberdeenshire uh, countryside. So that that uh, photograph is is taken um, very close to Aberdeen Airport um, and looking kind of northwest towards uh, towards Inverness um, in an area that, as you can see, is is uh, very much a sort of mixed farming type of area. Just to put a bit more context on that, um, we're sitting on the on the east coast of Scotland, um, 57 degrees north, uh, in an area sort of dominated by agricultural production, that's sort of 10% uh, of land down the east coast of Scotland where um, a lot of the production comes from, uh, around sort of 30% of the, the cereal production sits up in this northeast corner of Scotland. From a, from a soils perspective, um, we, we're sitting on uh, kind of mineral podzols, um, relatively freely drained, uh, acidic, uh, highly organic matter soils. Just to tell you something about the climate, um, we're looking at the last sort of 30 odd years of the experiment. Um, and most of the data I'm going to show you today is, is divided up into these kind of six year blocks, um, which are, we, our, our rotations are six year long rotations. So a lot of the data is, is averaged over, over six years. Um, and what the graph on the left suggests that uh, Aberdeen's got a little bit warmer over the last 30 years. Has it got wetter or drier? Well, that's that's a good question. Um, you know, people talk about 2018 as though it was excessively dry, but you know, as you can see on the right-hand side, that's not actually the driest year in the last 30 years. So rainfall uh, hasn't increased dramatically, um, although uh, perhaps the distribution of it has changed, and we seem to get a lot of it in August these days. So this is about agroecology. Um, and our experiments are, are based within an organic farm. And I thought I'd just start off by saying, well, what, what's the kind of relationship between agroecology and organic farming? So if, if we look at the definitions, the FAO talk about agroecology, about applying ecological concepts and principles, optimizing interaction between plants, animals, humans, and the environment. And if we look at organic agriculture, it's a production system that sustains the health of soils, ecosystems, and people and relies on ecological processes. So not everything agroecological is organic and not everything organic is agroecological, but somewhere at the heart of both is that idea that, uh, to quote Eve Balfour of the Soil Association, the health of soil, plants, animals, and man are one and indivisible. That idea of um, uh, managing ecological processes uh, in, in terms of, of agriculture. So that's where the, the background to, to this talk sits. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about the origins of the experiment 
um, and then go through the different phases because I think one of the interesting things about this experiment is how it's changed over time um, and what led us to making changes within the experiment. A lot of the data I'm going to show you will relate to crop yields and productivity because that's been the basis for many of the changes. But alongside that, and, and we can't show it in half an hour, but there's an enormous amount of data from the experiment around nutrient cycling, um, around weed communities, weed seed banks, um, and, and a small amount of, of, of biodiversity data. Um, and we've just actually had the entire site uh, sampled to look at uh, soil carbon stocks. We haven't seen the results yet, but that's something very exciting to come. So the origins of this experiment go back to uh, around 1990 when my colleague David Uni, who you can see there in his Sherlock Holmes outfit, um, was getting very interested in the importance of clover in livestock production systems. And he started an earlier experiment looking at uh, beef production systems and uh, how a clover based system compared with a nitrogen fertilizer based system. And that led to uh, thinking about having uh, a, an organic farming systems experiment uh, because he was he was one of our adv uh, college advisors and he was getting a lot of questions about, you know, what, what's the kind of best rotation to support an organic farm in, in the northeast of Scotland? Um, now, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to crop rotations, as we all know, the, 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 the Romans knew about it, uh, Jethro Tull uh, in the 17th century, um, the, the uh, Turnip Townsend, the Norfolk Forecast rotation, and then, you know, go back to 1870 and the, the annals of the, the Royal Highland Society, and they're talking about a disease called finger and toe in a, in a, in a rotation that is not sufficiently diverse. Um, and that, of course, is what we would now uh, think about as club root. So, you know, we think about the principles of rotation design and about the need to uh, alternate crops that build fertility and, and crops that exploit it um, and around uh, crops that have different susceptibilities to pests and diseases, so breaking pathogen cycles um, below ground as well as above ground growth habits and, and things like the management of weeds. Um, but when we come specifically to thinking about organic farming, um, and this is a quote from the, the European Union regulations, um, it talks about maintaining fertility and biological activity of soils effectively through legumes. So in the design of this experiment, very much thinking about agroecological principles, was, uh, was, was thinking about legume supported uh, cropping systems. So the desire was to have a, an experiment that, that replicated uh, a mixed farming system. Um, one of the, the, the criteria was that the plots in the experiment were big enough to have a core group of grazing animals. If you put one sheep on a plot, it just jumps into the next plot to, to meet its friends. So you know, the plots had to be big enough for a core group of grazing animals. Um, and as those of you who, who know this area, um, our ability to, to have those large plots led, led to a trade-off uh, in terms of, of, of land that was even vaguely flat. So um, the rep, the, there are two replicates of the experiment, although perhaps we would have liked more. So where we ended up uh, was um, having, uh, in the first phase of the experiment, uh, uh, two, two rotations, each replicated twice. Um, they were both um, stocked rotations, so uh, one of them has sort of 50 percent of the, the 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 period so three of the six years have a grass clover lay and then three years of cropping and the second rotation has four years of uh grass clover lay in six um but those are, are replicated as, as systems in the sense um that the manure that comes back into those systems is calculated to be related to the amount of livestock you can produce within that system so the idea that these are, if you like, miniature farmlets. So one of the strengths of the design is that all courses of the rotation are present in every year. Um, but one of the weaknesses uh, is that, that we only have the, the, the two replicates. So this is what the, 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 the systems looked like in that, in that first year. Um, as I've said, acidic soils, loss on ignition around 9-10%. Um, and these two rotations, which compared uh, a rotation with uh, three years of grass and clover, 
going into spring oats, uh, a swede crop, and then a spring oat back under sown into, into grass and clover, and, and a four-year rotation with, with four years of grass and clover and two crops of spring oats. So very much sort of traditional uh, northeast of Scotland rotations. In that first period, one of the things we did was to look at how the, the yield of, of spring oats uh, held up over time. Um, so the blue and the red uh, lines uh, are the, the two rotations that we call 50% and 67%. The yellow line is uh, spring oat yield from the national list recommended list uh, spring oat trials, which are um, what they call the, the uh, the non-treated, so uh, they do receive fertilizer, but they don't. Uh, they don't receive um, any any fungicides. Um, and what you see is that the uh, the yield of the organic oats was pretty much sort of keeping up with that. Where these are oats following on from that fertility building grass clover lay phase. But if you look at the blue and the red line, you see they're not really very different as perhaps you would you would expect from the the uh, the design of the rotations. In that first phase through to about 2006, uh, this is sort of averages across the trial of um, loss on ignition, uh, so you know, a crude measure of soil organic matter. And again, you see very little in the way of, of differences between the two rotations. So in 2006, we decided the experiment was really quite boring and we would like to do something different. It was time for a change. So at that time, the, there was a Scottish organic action plan about supporting more arable production. And we engaged with a group of farmers and advisors and policymakers um, uh, and also certification bodies about how we might redesign that trial. And that led us to, to phase two of Tullock, um, where we, uh, we kept the, the, the T50, the 50% rotation and, and, and that that is actually still there now in 2023. Um, and uh, we then uh, did something which perhaps was, was, was a little bit out there at the time in terms of going to, to a stockless organic rotation. So the, what we call the stockless system has no livestock in it. So there's no, no manure I applied either. So that system is running entirely uh, fueled by, um, in, in nitrogen terms, fueled by the legumes within the system. So we have a rotation that has a, a one year uh, grass red clover lay followed by five years of arable cropping. Uh, but pretty much every crop you could possibly under sow with clover is, is under sown. Some of you around, uh, some of you who are here today, I think will remember the discussions around this. Uh, and there was a heated debate as to whether we should have potatoes following grass red clover or wheat. What should be the, what should be the first crop to to follow that fertility building phase. And we couldn't agree, so we split the plots and we had a rotation that had uh, potatoes and then wheat and another one that had wheat and then potatoes and then going into a, a spring bean crop. Whilst maintaining uh, the 50% the, uh, the rotation, the difference, that the, the change we made there was to, to bring in a spring barley and to look at uh, the difference in having a, a first cereal that was a barley rather than oats. So what was the impact of that crop sequence decision about potatoes and wheat? Um, well, what we what we showed was that um, where uh, wheat followed potatoes, um, which is the, the pink line versus uh, wheat before potatoes, um, then the, 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 the wheat really benefits from being the first crop out of the lay. Um, the potatoes, if you look at the, the right hand side, the potatoes really didn't we didn't really didn't get any difference whether they were the first crop or the second crop. Um, one of the things I think we became critically aware of looking at this data is in that first year of this change in crop sequence, we saw very high uh, potato yields. But that, I think, is a legacy of uh, the previous uh, cropping system and having had four years of grass and clover within that, that system. And as you'll see, uh, the potato yields are pretty awful. And uh, in fact, after 2018, get even worse. And as the story develops, you'll see what we've done as a result of that. Just looking at a bit, a bit more at what has happened during those, those that uh, arable phase of the rotation. Um, 
what we've got here is a series of crops, um, of, the, of the cereal crops, so uh, oats, uh, barley and, and wheat, and uh, oats uh, and um, wheat are under sown with, uh, with, a, with a white clover lay. So this is just the last two cycles of the rotation, so the years where we have a comparison between cereals in a stocked and a stockless system. And if you look at the grey and orange bars, then in the in the the the, the, the fifth rotation, um, we see a, a a slight decline in in the cereal yields within the um, the T fifty the the, 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 the stock rotation, but we're seeing rather more dramatic decline in the blue and green bars, which are the um, the stockless system, the, the system that only has a, a one year red clover lay to fuel it. And this obviously has, has been of some concern in terms of, of the sustainability of that experiment. The, the other data that I'm going to show you uh, relates to grassland productivity. Um, legume based production systems, so that kind of agroecological approach to producing grassland. Um, and it's so hugely important within uh, this type of system. There's a lot of lot of complicated information here, but really what, what, I, what I'm going to concentrate on is, is looking at what happens during uh, the first and second year of the, the, the lays in the, in the two uh, rotations, the stocked uh, rotation with, with 50 and 67 percent lay, which are grazed in the first year and then silage cut in the second year with some applications of manure. And also to look at the the yields, what what happens over time within uh, the, the the grass red clover, the which is the uh, the nitrogen building phase of the, the stockless system. So we've used livestock unit grazing days as a uh, as a measure of the production of of the grazed lays, so that the sheep are are, are well the sheep are checked daily on the experiment. But they're moved in and out based on the on the on the height of the the the, the, the vegetation within the plots. Um, so uh, if we look at the, the top figure is is this fifty percent uh, lay, and what you see over time if we look at year one, which is grazed throughout, there's really not a great. There is some variability between the five different uh, uh, rotational cycles. But not really a huge difference over time, and and similarly, if, if the the, um, the third year where we've got um, uh, where, where where we've got grazing um, as well, not not a huge difference there. Um, the the sixty seven percent lay is rotation is is only there for the first three years, but again, not not a huge difference over those continuous rotational cycles. If we look at the uh, what what happens in the to, to the silage, which is uh, if we look at the, the the green blocks in the top uh, the top figure, uh, we've got two cuts of silage taken there. Um, the application of manure to the system was reduced slightly after the the first six years, um, on the grounds of feeling that the system wasn't balanced properly. Coming from from the advisory side. So that we will get a better balance of the system uh, by reducing the manure application slightly, and we see we see the impact of that on yield. But as we get into the fourth and fifth rotation, we're starting to see uh, more of a decline in in the yield, as causing us to to ask questions about what was going on within that system. If we look at the the, the cut and mulch grass red clover in the stockless system. Uh, pretty much over the, the three cycles of the rotation where that's been present, that's a, 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 the grass red clover lay, which is cut and mulched. We see very little difference um, in terms of, of average yields. So we start to say, well, well, what's what's going on here? So looking again at, at loss on ignition, and this is specifically in the grassland plots as opposed to the, the data I showed you earlier, which was averaged across the rotation. Um, and what we see actually is 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 not uh, not a huge change, perhaps some evidence for a slight decline there in terms of of loss and ignition, but not not huge differences across the across the stock system. Um, but if you look at the kind of orangey colours of the the grass red clover lay, again some more of a, a suggestion of, of a decline there in terms of the loss on ignition. So you know this led us to the question: What is it that's that's influencing 
um, the that what's causing that that decline in, in yield in the grass clover. So the next thing to say was, well, so what about the extractable uh, P and K uh, levels within uh, within the soil? Um, and if we look at uh, look at the potassium, remembering that these are these are pretty sandy soils, um, somewhere around eight or nine percent clay. Um, so there's not a lot of uh, not not a great deal of potassium within the system. Again, sh showing a, a slight decline there over over time in terms of the uh, the extractable uh, K levels, um, and seeing again a slight decline there in the K levels across. The, the, the grass red clover lay, but it's, it's phosphorus where we see um, something rather more dramatic. Uh, so this is um, soil P in terms of uh, modified Morgans as the extractant for those of you interested in that. Um, and what we've seen is uh, a more severe decline in terms of the extractable P. So a, a number of, of the things that we've seen here in terms of changes in yield, but also um, in terms of what's going on with uh, extractable uh, soil nutrients in the system. Led us to think, actually, do, do, we need to, do, do we need to think again about where we are with the decline in, uh, where, where we are with this experiment in terms of the rotation? The stockless system, in a way, was an experiment in itself. Could we maintain yields in, uh, in an organic system? Uh, that was not relying on any uh, external inputs of fertility. So we reached a situation where uh, soil fertility is declining um, and uh, we also have a cooch grass problem in the stockless system and that's part of the reason for the, the potato yield decline is difficulty in harvesting them due to cooch grass. Where we ended up uh, a year ago was deciding that we needed to, to reset the stockless system but we wanted to continue the stocked system because it's still relevant um, and, and it gives us a, a continuity. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Rob. Um, Rob, if you shout at me when you want the, um, uh, when you want the slides moved on, Rob's going to, going, to, going to take you into kind of phase three and, and the new rotation at Tullock. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Uh, yeah, so hi everyone. Yeah, my name's Rob Graham. I've been at SIUC for about two and a half years now and um, sort of fortuitous. I joined at a time when we have been looking at um, changing some of the rotations or some of the, the sort of areas we're going to be looking at with uh, regards to the Tulloch rotation plots. And, um, and that's mainly due, down due to uh, what Chris has said about the, the problems that we've sort of found so far about uh, declining soil fertility and, and couch grass in particular and how you know so so we've been exploring over the last year or so as to how we might try and mitigate against those things and also what can we do in the future to, to produce a meaningful rotation that will be um, uh, useful say in thinking about future farming systems in in a decade or so but also, you know, now what what what's useful now is to and um, what are people looking for? So yes, Chris, if you could turn to the next slide. So so what is what are some of the the questions that we've explored over the past year or so? So this has been part of a, a small project which has been led by Kirsty Top, um, and we've been able to ask or consult with a number of different people, both within industry within our own consultancy. Um, at SAC Consultancy and also our own research staff as well about what are some of the big questions that need to be um, considered when we're talking about future organic rotations or future agroecology rotations in sustainable agriculture. So some of the, the areas we've explored are sort of self-sufficiency, uh, we might want to optimise residue return, um, the second point there is about local sustainable inputs. So in particular, is it important that things are sourced locally and all the inputs that we have are essentially from the same farm? So it's, it's a, a kind of a, a circular economy within the farm. Crop diversity is a big talking point at the moment. You know, so what, what sort of crops are important, both from an economic point of view, but also an ecological point of view. 
what would be the most sustainable thing to be planted or to be grown at, at any particular time and then regenerative farming as well as obviously quite a lot of talk around those so these are all policy questions that the scottish government want an evidence base for so there's a lot of talk around these points but there's actually quite only you know very little evidence um, around some of these these questions that are being asked so the the upshot of our sort of um, the project that we had and the consultations that we had with it with our colleagues is that we came up with a scientific question and, and that question is that in for our, our future rotation um, design and, and the experiments that we want to to carry out at the, the Tullach um, trial area is that can we use crops or or you know what's the crop management um, to manipulate carbon nitrogen ratios uh, of residues and therefore you know what is the organic matter balance that we can kind of optimize uh, within those ranges so that's our sort of fundamental question going forward and then how do we actually carry that out that's something that we we need to focus on a, a little bit more if i could move on to the next slide chris what i should mention at this point also is that because of the change in potential the questions that we're asking this will also impact upon the different funding um, avenues and streams that we're we're looking at um, in the future to try and um, to fund some of the, the experiments that, that we want to carry out so up to, up to now we've been exceptionally uh, fortunate that the scottish government through their core funding resas projects have, have have often covered uh, some of the, the sort of more fundamental aspects of, of the rotation plots that we've had. So, so a lot of the sort of core maintenance um, has be, been able to be carried out by, by some of that core funding that we've had. But we've also had uh, funding inputs from EU projects, so EU Legging Futures, um, and also other, other projects that, that we've been able to pick up along the way have added to the maintenance costs, but also specific um, experiments that have taken place during the rotation and, and sort of short uh, focused experiments that have taken place during that time. But certainly going forward, we're looking to expand and, and to uh, diversify our areas of, of funding sources and some of the experimental areas that we're also looking at will sort of uh, diversify away from the sort of core uh, farming um, areas that perhaps we've looked at or concentrated more on to date. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. So what are um, some of the plans that we want to make for the future? Well, if anything, it's if anything that history has taught us is to expect the unexpected. It's very, sometimes it's quite difficult to no matter how much planning you put in place there are things that will will crop up um, that will impact upon the the system or, or the management areas that you're looking at so to date we've had uh, a number of issues um or you know at, at various times during the course of the of the experiment we've had we've had issues crop up so we've had um, we're in a, a reasonably rural area up in the northeast of Scotland, so we get uh, issues with um, grazing from deer and also potential problems within our trial areas from badgers. But one of the main um, problems is um, from um, an area of, of flooding that periodically uh, seems to impact upon our, our trial area. But um, as we are re redesigning our trial area and our, our sort of rotation area at this time, it is a good time to get these issues sorted out so that we can go into this new phase of our, of our rotation um, with everything as well designed and as, as, as well managed as possibly we can without these, these natural <laughs> problems occurring. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. So what's next for Tullock? So the last year or two, we, we've been thinking broadly around uh, these, these themes. And I say we consulted with, with various colleagues uh, and industry as well. So we will be continuing with publications from existing data sets. So Chris has touched on some of the data that we have from the 32 years that the Tullock 
um, rotational trials have been running and we have you know more data that is available and, and we, we will be publishing those. We'll also be continuing with the fundamental comparisons so with the stopped and the stopless um, uh, rotations but we hope to broaden the scope of some of the the, the sort of key questions that, that we're asking uh, within our trial areas. So we should be looking at things such as nature-based solutions. So continuing our sustainable and eco ecological approaches, but basing those around the, the sort of contemporary um, areas of research that are key for policy makers at this time. So we'll be concentrating, as I said, on, on stocked and stockless and comparing the two, as that's a really important area, um, especially with all the talk around sort of livestock farming. Um, we'll be incorporating bulky organic inputs where applicable, and those might be locally sourced. So again, as I mentioned earlier about trying to maintain perhaps a, a, a sort of um, you know, incredibly uh, a local source of, of inputs onto our, our farming system. We'll also be looking at nutrient cycling and the key influences that perhaps microbial processes have on these. So to date, we haven't really looked at any of the microbial activities that are happening uh, within soil and with, within the plants, within the cropping area. But certainly this is something that we'd like to increase our focus on. Um, and, and it's a really important area, both within in the nutrient cycling and also ultimately impacting upon yields that, that farmers or growers will see. But also, should we be only looking at so high end outputs or niche products um, in, in this type of farming system? Maybe this type of farming system doesn't really relate to uh, sort of mass productivity. So, so is it something, so, so are the the, the crops that we're growing, should they be those high-end niche products? And is that something that we should be um, uh, sort of concentrating on? So as I said, the consultations have taken place over the last 18 months or so, and this has really influenced our, our thoughts and the direction that we do take these future, um, these future rotational um, experiments. So next slide, please, Chris. And we've come up with this, um, this uh, rotational um, experimental design for, for the new phase, so for the third phase of, of the of the Tulloch experiments. So we'll have, um, you can see on, on this, at, at the top there, we have the, what we call the stocked uh, rotation. So this is where potentially we would have, uh, or, or we will have grazing animals and, uh, within, our, within, our, um, within our rotations. So we'll have three years of, of grass clover, followed by uh, spring oats, followed by kale, and followed by um, barley. For the new uh, rotation for our stockless um, experiments, at the bottom we have um, a diverse herbal mix, and then lay barley, and then pulses, kale, tricrop of peas, of, of buckwheat and barley, and then spring oats. Um, at the end. So that's giving us our, our stockless and our, our different um, combinations of, of props um, within, the, within the stockless area to maintain, or the thought is to try and maintain those uh, essential nutrients and, and ultimately the yields of our, of our crop. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. So that's, that's really where we're going. So some of the take-home thoughts from, from this talk is that we have a currently have a, a comprehensive data set and, and samples archive um, that are stored up here at, at uh, SIUC Aberdeen. Um, these are certainly open to exploration and collaboration, and we welcome any collaboration um, and, and any interest that people may have in both that set of archives that we have and also from the, 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 the data set that we have also. Uh, the future direction of these experiments is really about improved understanding of how management and ecology interact. So want to, it's almost um, with, with some of the sort of evolution of our, our sort of changing interests um, of, of some of our staff members here as well, it, 
it seems sensible to go in that direction of, of how can we marry sort of ecological processes and some of the, the management processes that we see in, in, in um, uh, contemporary agriculture. We'll also have a greater focus on biodiversity aspects uh, in the future. But also agroecological approaches have a massive part to play in future farming uh, from a net zero perspective um, and also in the, the food and feed and the land sparing, land sharing debates that are currently occurring at, at policy level. And this is ultimately linked to human nutrition, um, which is also a key interest um, for our future and certainly some of the, the key collaborations that we see working on these projects um, together. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. And we're just to finish on uh, some of the papers that uh, uh, Chris and colleagues have, have had out recently. So this is using the data, the long-term data sets uh, from the Tulloch experiments. And these are a um, couple of papers out in, in nature communications and nature sustainability and just shows the, you know, the importance of these long-term data sets and how, you know, with um, a number of different projects can, can use these data sets. So those are just a, a couple of examples of our papers. But as I say, we're very keen to uh, collaborate more broadly with, with people and any interest that people may have. And just go on to the next slide, which is just to say thank you very much for your time. Um, we have to th give thanks to David Dick and also the, the technical team of the field trials who who made these um, you know several years of work. Um, but I'll pass over to Chris actually to, to give thanks because uh, she's been working on the projects far longer than I have, so I'm sure she will have <laughs> thanks to give people. Yeah, thanks, 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 Rob. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is uh, as as anybody who's been long involved in long term experiments know, uh, it's 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 a team effort, and we're we're really grateful to the huge number of people who've been involved in the day to day running. But as I say, I think some of you around uh, around this virtual table have been involved in some of the the, the consultations um, in 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 the in sort of past and 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 present and uh, i hope you will will continue to to interact with us on talk in the future so thank you very much